Hello, this is Lerone Kuntz, and this is On The Stoop, but I'm not on my stoop today. I'm in front of the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse here in Manhattan where the trial is actually taking place. Today is Saturday, it's not happening today, but it's happening on Monday. And um, I figure they got some cool steps, so this is my stoop today. Um, like I said on my last recording, I'm going to give you an update on Friday's proceedings. So this is the update for the Norman Seabrook trial for day 10 of his trial, which took place on Friday, November 3rd. All right. Like I said in the previous video, they were going to call three COBA executive board members to testify, which they did. They called the treasurer, Mikey Maiello. They called the financial secretary, Amelia Warner. And they called one of the trustees, whose name is Daniel Palmieri. All right. As they started discussing, as they started to um, ex uh, question these executive board members, we got a picture of how the board operates as it relates to this $20 million. There is an annuity fund board or, or committee that consists of four trustees. The four trustees of this committee that administer the annuity fund are Norman Seabrook, Elias Hasimuddin, Mikey Maiello, Michael Maiello, and Amelia Warner. Those are the four trustees of the annuity fund. The annuity fund has two companies that they use to invest with at this time. This is a meeting, they had a meeting of this board in January of 2014. So, they made it known at this, this hearing that they had two companies that they invested with. One company was named Advent Intercontinental, the other company was named Wright Investments. They were concerned, Norman called the meeting, he's the chairman, they were concerned about the investments because right, right investments was underperforming. So they wanted to, I guess, seek out other options. They had Platinum Partners come to this meeting in January and they made a presentation that took about 15 to 20 minutes to talk about their um, options or their products that they had that they were trying to sell to the union to get them to invest. In this meeting, like I said, you had the four trustees and you had two advisors. You had two financial advisors. You had a guy named Thomas Reynolds and you had another guy named um, Howard Ween. One of them is a lawyer from Cole and Isaacs, but they are both financial advisors. All right, so after the presentation, they had a um, resolution and this resolution said that they were going to move $10 million from Wright Investments to Platinum Partners contingent upon due diligence that were, was going to be performed by the two financial advisors and they would submit the results of their due diligence to the chairman who is Norman Seabrook, okay? And they were to, to find out whether the, this type of investment or, or whether it was prudent to make this um, investment. In February, a month later, the two, investors, the two advisors sent a letter to Norman. And this letter detailed some concerns that they had about Platinum Partners. And um, as I listened to what this letter contained, four things stuck out in my mind, excuse me, about this letter. Um, and I'm gonna tell you right now, the first thing that they said that, that I caught was, other supplemental benefit funds don't normally invest in hedge funds. Meaning that other unions that have supplemental annuity funds and things like that, they don't invest in hedge funds. And if they do ever invest in hedge fund, it's not directly in the hedge fund, it's in what they call a fund of funds, which is sort of like a mutual fund that contains hedge funds. So 
So that's the first um, area of concern that they had. Then they said that it's difficult to recover in the event of fraud. So they're saying that that's self-explanatory, that if something goes wrong, it's difficult for you to recover your money when you invest in this hedge fund. Thirdly, they said, in the hedge fund offering plan, it is very blunt about the risk, meaning that the, the literature or the information that they got from Platinum Partners, it really outlines the risk and it's really blunt when they talk about the risk in investing in Platinum Partners hedge fund. And the fourth thing that they outlined was, and this is the kicker right here, it says you should be prepared and accept the risk of losing the entire investment. You should be prepared and accept the risk of losing the entire investment. This is what your financial advisors are saying to the annuity fund board. Okay, Norman got this letter in February. Um, from the accounts of Michael Aiello, who is the treasurer, as well as the accounts from Amelia Warner, who was the financial secretary, they said they never saw this letter. They never saw it. They didn't know that the due diligence was done. However, the transfer was made in, in March of $10 million from Wright Investments to Platinum Partners. So that's the first $10 million. The second money transfer that went to Platinum Partners was in June, but it wasn't from the annuity fund. It was from the general fund. The general fund is comprised of money that is collected from the officers in the form of union dues. Every two weeks, the officers um, pay their union dues, and at the end of the month, the, the city um, gives a check to the, the, the COBA with that money. The union, the COBA, they maintain between eight and a half million to $10 million in a general fund. And that was used to administer the COBA. It was used for the rent, for the, the spaces that they, they use. It was used for the payroll for people that worked in the COBA. It was used for printing services. It was used for public relations services. So this is what that money was for and it wasn't invested. They don't invest that money. They keep it there to run the daily operations. And um, in June, Norman sent a letter to the bank that was holding some of the money in a um, money market account, told them to transfer $5 million to Platinum Partners. Mike, in order to transfer the money out of that account, the treasurer also has to sign. So you need two signatures. You need Seabrook's signatures and you need Mr. Maelo's signature as well. Mike, Michael Maelo says that he didn't know about this transfer, that he didn't know Seabrook's wanted to transfer the money. He didn't know that the money was being transferred. When he came in on Friday, which was the 5th, he had um, an email from the bank asking for his signature to transfer $5 million from the general fund to Platinum Partners. He said that he signed it, he sent the, he sent the fax with his signature, and it went through. Um, he said he was upset about it. Nevertheless, he signed it. And they asked him, well, if you were upset about it and you didn't know about it and you hadn't approved it or anything like that, why did you sign it? And he said, well, it, it was already done. Norman had already sent the money and this was just sort of like a formality that he could, there was nothing he could do about it. Which um, is not true, I don't think, because if the bank is required, or if it's required, if it's set up that it requires two signatures to transfer money from an account, the, tr the bank cannot process that transfer without both of those signatures. So had Mr. Maelo not signed that document to send that money, that money wouldn't have been sent in my view. All right, so that was the second transaction. So now we're at $15 million that has been sent to Platinum Partners. The third transaction was a result of a meeting that they had in July 
of 2014. In July 29th of 2014, they had another annuity fund board meeting with the four trustees, Norman, Elias, Michael, and Amelia. The four trustees were there. They signed another resolution to send another $5 million to Platinum Partners. So in um, August, another $5 million was sent to Platinum Partners. So you have their signatures on this resolution. You have all their signatures on the resolution that was signed in um, January. And then, you know, we spoke about the other $5 million that was sent from the general fund. So that totals $20 million. So that's how your $20 million got the Platinum Partners. Now, the prosecution tried to make the case that Seabrook is in total control of the union. Okay, that he is the man that is responsible for this. All right. Um, Mikey Maelo said that at that first meeting in January when they spoke about mutual funds, he didn't even know what a mutual fund was. He's a treasurer and he didn't know what, the, what a mutual fund was. Um, he said he never saw the letter that the due diligence was done. And from what I was able to ask the attorney, he never asked about the letter either. Being that he's the treasurer, I'm sure he knew that the money was transferred. $10 million was transferred, but he never saw the um, due diligence information. So he never knew about the red flags that they had outlined about Platinum Partners. Ms. Warner, the financial secretary, said she never saw the due diligence letter either. And she said she didn't really know what a hedge fund was too either at the time when they were, had the presentation. Um, my thing is that if you don't know, you need to ask. You have advisors there on staff that you could, you're paying. So if you don't know what a mutual fund, I mean, you, don't, you don't know what a hedge fund is, that's the time to ask. Or before that money is transferred, the money was transferred two months later, there was enough time for you to do your due diligence and find out what a hedge fund was and inquire about what these two financial advisors were finding when they were trying to um, investigate Platinum Partners, that evidently was not done. So they are all saying that Seabrook is in control. They all had stories about how Seabrook um, would yell at them if they stepped out of line and that, you know, they were just there pretty much to co-sign whatever Norman did. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the picture that they painted. I guess they were trying to distance themselves from what was going on. So that's what we got on that end. Um, there's some information that they talked about in passing about um, William Valentine. Um, that concern, that that was a story that um, Mr. Um, Palmieri told. He said that they had a meeting where they were that Norman had wanted to remove William Valentine's stipend. William, Va William Valentine at that time was the corresponding secretary of the COBA. So they had a meeting, I guess he and Norman didn't see eye to eye, and Norman wanted to um, remove his stipend. And everybody that was on the executive board voted to remove his stipend except for Daniel Palmieri, William Valentine, and one other trustee. And after the meeting, Mr. Palmieri says that Norman said for him and the other trustee that voted against him to, to stay. And when everybody left, Seabrook started arguing with them and yelling at them and telling them, you know, they have to be loyal, they have to do pretty much what he's telling them to do. Um, they made it clear that Seabrook is the person that controls whether or not they have release time, meaning that. He controls whether or not they go back to the jail. He controls whether or not they um, maintain their stipends and maintain their cars and things like that. So he is holding all the cards as far as the, the prosecution is trying to um, represent. And the um, executive board members, the three that came and testified, they supported that argument that 
Seabrooks is in total control of the union and they are just yes men are co-signers to whatever else that he wants to do if they're not if they don't do what he says then he's going to send them back to the jail so that's the picture that they tried to paint or that they did paint on friday about they also went into the um financial thing again and they went to you know, his financial accounts his personal financial accounts um and they also brought back up his accounts with Mohegan Sun Casino. Now, before I get into that, I want to give you a little disclaimer. <laughs> and I should have gave you the disclaimer on all of this stuff that I'm talking about before I even started talking about any of this. But with that said, when they present the evidence, when the lawyers present the evidence, they are presenting the evidence to the jury. They're not presenting the evidence to the spectators. We are spectators. Each juror has a television screen in front of them. And whenever the lawyers talk about documents or they have exhibits, they put them on this, their screens. So they can see exactly what the lawyers are talking about. We spectators are in a you know, certain area and there's a big screen TV and they put the documents on this big screen TV, but the TV's at an angle. So the whole room can see the TV. But sometimes they, they don't enlarge it so we can see it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, depending on what they're talking about. And they know that the jury is gonna get all these documents anyway at the end of you know, the trial. We're not gonna ever see these documents again, not unless you know, we, we get the transcript or whatever. So what I'm trying to say is that some of the things that I see, you know, I can't really see everything that's on the screen. Um, some things I'm trying to listen to hear what they're talking about. So some of the numbers and maybe some of the dates, you know, may not be totally accurate. So don't hold me to that. And if I'm misrepresenting anything that one of the um, people that testified today or uh, Friday said or talked about, I'm sorry about that as well. Um, with that said, they talked about C. Brooks's Mohican Sun account. They said in 2010, he had a positive balance, they had, had a negative balance of $11,000 in this Mohican Sun account. In 2013, he had a $6,700 credit in that account. So he was up $6,700. In 2014, they said he had $40,000 in losses, which brought it to $34,000 deficit in that account in the red. In 2015, he had $66,000 in the red in that Mohican Sun account. And in 2016, it was a $70,000 deficit in that account. So they're, they're trying to make the case that Seabrook has gambling debts. And that's the motivation for him cutting this deal where he was gonna receive this money from Jonah Resnick and Platinum Partners. They also put into evidence a check from Platinum Partners to JSR Capital. JSR Capital is the company that Jonah Resnick owns. So you have a $60,000 check going from Platinum Partners, Murray Hub of Huberfeld to Jonah Resnick. So they're trying to represent that. That's the $60 that Resnick was reimbursed by Huberfeld to pay off Seabrook, okay? Now you gotta remember, Norman Seabrook is not on trial by himself. He has a co-defendant, which is Murray Huberfeld, who is the guy who runs Platinum Partners. They are both being charged with honest service fraud because they're saying that Norman accepted the bribe and Huberfeld paid the bribe or made the bribe. So they charged both of them with this crime. 
So they are trying to use that $60,000 check to implicate Huberfeld and tie it in with Norman and um, Jonah Resnick. So that's what happened on Friday. Now, one other thing before I go, it's getting late. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, or I want to speak about, is um, the fact that Amelia Warner, when they asked her questions about what is her job description, what does she do, she said, my job is to get the check from the city and bring it to the COVA. And they kind of had to like prod her to tell what else she does. And she said, well, I sit in on meetings. Now she's a financial